Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Zoom session on um, a panel discussion on Tejanos of the Texas Revolution. We are lucky today. We are joined with some um, incredible panelists. Um, I am Ernesto Rodriguez. I will be moderating the panel. I am the curator here at the Alamo. And today we are joined by Dr. David Carlson, the archivist, genealogist, historian, and researcher. David Carlson has been the, the curator and custodian of the Bear County Spanish Archives since September of 2012. He is trained as a historian of 19th and 20th century Latin America. He completed his PhD in history at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in 2007. When he's not reading books, he plays fetch with his rescue dash hound Mick and Chihuahuas, brews beer, bakes bread, and cooks with his wife, librarian Deidre McDonald, goes hiking, cycling, and is out exploring historic sites or firing muzzle loaders. Another panelist is Dr. Jesus Frank de la Teja. He has been studying Mexican and Texas history for almost 40 years and is the author of numerous works on Spanish, Mexican, and Republic era Texas and Borderland. Formerly Director of Archives and Records of the Texas General Land Office, he retired as a professor of history and director of the Center for Study of the Southwest at Texas State University in 2017. He is a past president of the Texas State Historical Association, served as the inaugural state historian of Texas, and has been a member of numerous boards associated with the teaching and preservation of Texas history. We are also joined by Dr. Gilberto Hinojosa, who has written academic works on the Spanish Mexican Laredo, oh, Spanish Mexican Laredo, the missionary led Indian towns, and on immigrant communities, and published articles on history and culture in San Antonio. Express News, <clears throat> the Santa Express News, sorry. Dr. Hinojosa is a professor emeritus of the University of the Incarnate Word, Department of History. And lastly, we are joined by Dr. Gerald Foyle, who is the O'Connor Professor in the History of Hispanic Texas and the Southwest and Chair of the History Department at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. In 1983, he received his PhD in Latin American History from the University of Florida. His research has focused on the <clears throat> intersection of Latin America, uh, Latin American and US Latino history, especially on the history of Cuban exile communities in the United States during the 19th and 20th centuries, the origins of Tejano communities in colonial and Mexican Texas, and Latino history narratives. He also happened to be my professor when I attended St. Mary's University, and he was also my boss when I worked for him at, at the university as a grad student. So I'm real pleased to have all of you on board. And um, we are going to start our discussion today by uh, having uh, Dr. David Carlson explain the Bear County Spanish Archives and their primary sources in the Tejano community. Uh, yes, hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my video is being blocked uh, by the host for some reason. I had to switch computers, so um, I'm not sure if that can be resolved. Uh, just to be brief, uh, speaking informally before the broadcast, uh, Dr. Poyo uh, reminded me that the archives um, of the Spanish colonial inheritance of Bear County and also the Mexican Republic era uh, is really reflected in the historiography. Um, everything from 1717 uh, until the uh, onset of the Texas Revolution in 1835 and 1836 uh, is stored away. Um, and these records uh, have been microfilmed. And the microfilm, of course, is available at any of a number of research universities and uh, also at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we also have uh, a copy of all 172 rolls of microfilm and other materials that were never uh, imaged at the Bear County Archives building. Um, at, and, you know, in my capacity, I'm the curator and the custodian uh, of these records, uh, a deputy of the county clerk, Ms. Lucy Adame Clark. So, um, yeah, if people are interested in researching this stuff, we can, we can uh, give you a hand. Thank you. Oh, yes. Here is the uh, signature of James Bowie with his trademark 
sort of whirlwind tornado uh, rubric underneath his name. Uh, this is the wedding uh, marriage contract. Um, the uh, Betamendi family sponsored Jim Bowie's uh, Mexican citizenship in 1830. And um, his business partner and his uh, suegro, his, his father-in-law, uh, gave him his eligible daughter's hand in marriage, 19-year-old Maria Ursula de Beramendi, uh, a woman with a tremendous amount of wealth in her dowry. And so that's reflected in this marriage contract. This is one of the, one of the records that we uh, conserve. Thank you very much, Dr. David Carlson, for uh, taking care of such a such an important part of our history. Sure. And, uh, and also for helping us out on a lot of our projects that we have here at the Alamo. Um, we're going to um, we're going to start the discussion, and uh, I'm going to start it by uh, by picking a person at random to start the discussion, and it has nothing to do with the fact that uh, that I've known him for most of my adult life. But Dr. Poyo, I'll start with you, and then uh, the rest of you are more than welcome to join in. What are the Tejano contributions during the movement of Mexican independence? And that's 18, you know, 1810. The independence period the, during the 1810, 1813? Or, all, you know, 1810, we can go from 10 to 21, you know, the Mexican revolution of the independence period. What are the contributions that the Tejano community in San Antonio or in Texas in general um, provided for Mexican independence? Well, um, of course, um, Texas independence is a is a is a long a long a long story, and it uh, has both obviously uh, a, a Spanish period element, and it's got a um, Mexican period element, um, and um, I always like to begin <clears throat> thinking about this, uh, which is which is somewhat reflected in the, the book of mine, uh, um, Tejano Journey, uh, which in which I date a lot of this activity between 1770 uh, and 18, 1850, more or less. Um, but in, in the eight, early 1870s uh, into 80s and 90s, I, if you look at the research, uh, especially the research on the Cabildo, uh, you can get a sense of growing uh, discomfort and dis dissent between the local Cabildo and the governor um, and sort of the authorities uh, south of, uh, of Texas. Um, uh, for example, there's a, an assault on the, uh, on the Cabildo trying to during periods, get rid of the cabildo or or diminish its size or diminish its power, mm -hmm. and so this this kind of um, this, this in some ways begins to set up the dynamic that we'll see that leads to the eighteen ten to eighteen thirteen period when you have the Hidalgo report uh, revolt, and you've already have some built in uh, resentments towards uh, Spanish power among some. Um, and, uh, and so you have a core of, uh, of Tejanos who rise up against the Spanish and sort of, and, and then of course are defeated. And this, this develops a, a, deep, a deep resentment and long memory among these Tejanos who later on play a much bigger role uh, in, in when, the Texas, when the Texas Revolution uh, comes around. So a lot of the families that were um, um, that hurt and harmed uh, in the first war uh, come back um, already with a lot of suspicion of central power in Mexico and begin this, um, and, and those, those sectors of Tejano society then of course uh, join, ultimately join the Anglo revolution. Um, but, but I think we need to also remember that um, that it's a it's a it's a it's a complex story because uh, in the end the number of Tejanos joining the revolution uh, were smaller than the, the number that were either neutral or were loyal to Mexico. 
And sometimes we talk about it in a one dimensional way as if, as if Tejanos were, uh, were, um, were all in support of the revolution when in fact um, that, that wasn't the case. And so uh, anyway, that just, that's just to complicate the issue a little bit. I don't yeah, want to dominate here. Yeah. I don't want to dominate here. So let me let me turn that over to to somebody else. It's, and if you go back, um, that ambivalence that one sees in in 1835, 1836 is is present as well uh, earlier on. And so we we can't. I I don't like the word contribution is, because it seems always one sided. Uh, I like the word role because it allows for the complexity that, that Jerry was just mentioning. Uh, there were men like, uh, well, somebody I'm studying right now, uh, Erasmo Seguin, uh, but also even Juan Martin Veramendi, who was just brought up earlier. Um, both of those men during the uh, Casas revolt, which was the first uh, manifestation of a pro Hidalgo revolt in Texas. Um, and it happened in January, January, February of 1811, uh, both of those individuals were loyalists at the time. In fact, they participated in a counter revolt that was organized by a uh, subdeacon, Juan Manuel uh, um, um, Sambrano, who, uh, or, who sort of organized uh, a group of leading Bejareños uh, to overthrow Casas, who was a retired a militia officer from, from Nuevo Santander, what is now Tamaulipas, who'd retired in San Antonio and who was spearheading this pro Hidalgo revolt in San Antonio. And he managed to actually capture the government. Um, and so these other men represent the, a, continuous, a continuing loyalty to the crown. Um, and yet some of them, when the Gutierrez McGee expedition shows up in 1813 at the doorstep of San Antonio are more than willing to um, uh, turn around and support uh, the, the re this new rebellion. Um, and so the, the ambivalence, the not quite being sure of which way things are going to fall uh, often has to be uh, taken into consideration when you're studying these men. They, they live in not only uncertain times, but in a very uncertain situation where communications are spotty. Uh, you don't really know who your friends and your enemies are. Uh, you have economic links to some people, but you have um, fraternal or, or um, vassal links, if you will, to others. And so it, 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 does, um, it does put them in a spot. And, and I'll stop here. I'll let uh, Hilberto might want to. Well, there's, there's the context of the forging of a new nation uh, or the beginnings of the forging of a new nation. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long and difficult process. And it's, it's interesting to, uh, to uh, do just a little bit of comparison. Uh, the, uh, even in, in the American experience, uh, George Washington himself had difficulty talking about the nation. Uh, and so he didn't use the term the nation and he used the term the United States in a plural sense. And the, the United States in a singular uh, sense is long in coming. And so the issue of the, the birth of the Mexican nation and the forging of a nation is a complex uh, issue especially on the, on the fringes, uh, it would be one where it's expected. Uh, if we go back a little bit further back um, to the formation of the Bejar community, and Frank would probably be able to say this, uh, when would you say that the, uh, that the Isleños saw themselves as Bejareños? In the 1770s? Well, well, that, I mean, it's a good question because obviously um, some of them, uh, particularly the Arochas uh, and the Traviesos uh, can uh, continue to, um, um, how, I hate to put it in transactional terms, but they, they continue to trade 
on their Canary Islander roots in a way that some of the other families don't. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but generally speaking, um, the, all of the Isleño families uh, find it necessary to integrate with right, the right. with the Mexican families. To so to some degree, um, they are forging this new identity, um, which um, because in in the context of later times when Canary Islands are seen as part of the old world and therefore part of the European experience, it, it takes on an added cachet. Um, that being Mexican, um, which is associated with with Indianness, with the indigenous, and right. and um, creates problems. Um, and so uh, people like um, Jose Antonio Navarro, whose roots are in are in Corsica, um, um, or uh, some of these other leading men who may have some Canary Islander roots but others may not are all bundled together as, as Europeans. Um, and the, and the rest of the population of San Antonio is, is set apart as, as Mexican. Um, and so what our problem as historians is to try and decipher and getting back to Gilberto's point is um, when in fact people start identifying themselves locally Right. And, and you don't really see an expression of, um, of a, um, of a demonym, um, that is specific to San Antonio until the 19th century, you begin to see, uh, terms like, um, like Bejareño, um, only come around like the 1840s or so before that I have yet to, uh, Located, it might have been in use, but it doesn't make it into the documents. So when, oh. when in official correspondence and whatnot, they're still they they still talk about themselves as the people of Behar, or they're talking about our ancestors, or they're talking about the Canary Islands, they're uh, being of Canary Islander descent or descendants of the first settlers, but they haven't named themselves. Yeah. The reason the reason I brought up the 1700s is is the. Uh, uh, 1770s rather, is, is uh, the, the possibility of the connections that you did, uh, Frank, you did an excellent uh, piece on the uh, trade with Saltillo. And uh, there's some indication that beginning in the 1770s, the drives were to New Orleans, to Louisiana, uh, that where you would get a better return for your drive, even though it was illegal. Uh, and so on. The, uh, and so I wonder if the change in trade would coincide with some kind of a change in identity. In, in, the, in the understanding that identity, as you, as you mentioned, is fluid, which I, complicates I, things. I, I, it looks like we've shifted into the notion of identity, uh, uh, Ernesto. Is that going to be all right? We'll move it, into that right fine. now. It'll be fine. Okay. I was about to ask a question. Um, okay. And it was about the um, the caste system because we've started we basically started going into that a little bit. And okay. what role do you all think that the caste system played in? Let's go back to the formation of the Tejano community in, in Texas as a whole. Let me let me just start with the with the idea that uh, identity, of course, first of all, is pretty fluid, and and every identity has. Uh, lots of pieces to the puzzle. And uh, so you have to kind of look at it in a very complex way. And I, I'd like to, I like to think of, of identity by looking at the kinds of things that people do. So uh, uh, people's political ideas and people's economic ideas and their social attitudes and their cultural expressions and their religious uh, practices, all of these things play into identity. So if you were to think of this Tejano experience in terms of each of those, that would uh, give you a, a sense of sort of the pieces of the puzzle that are at work. And so I would say, uh, speaking about the political piece, uh, which we were just talking about, um, I think a good, a good uh, term uh, to, to, uh, that's, that's very popular in, in Latin American historiography is the notion of la patria chica 
or the little the little country, right? The little, uh, in other words, people's, people were connected. They didn't have internet back then. They weren't, uh, they weren't talking between, Santi, uh, between San Antonio and Buenos Aires or, or Lima. Um, so uh, they were, their, their identification was naturally and foremost with their local community. And so I think that right there is one piece of the puzzle. And of course, this plays out all the way through the Texas Revolution, where you say, well, well, how could the how could the Tejanos who did, were they loyal to Mexico? And then you have to say, well, you know, uh, which Mexico? And uh, and you have to start thinking about it uh, from from that sort of very local and provincial point of view, I think. Um, and, and I just I'll let somebody else talk, but but I would also add just briefly that it's important also to look at that economic piece that, that Dr. Hinojosa just just uh, mentioned, social attitudes, and that's where the casta system comes in. Uh, and the casta system is based on notions of, 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 of mestizaje, um, the cultural expression, uh, sort of ranching culture, uh, and, and religious piety, right? Uh, and, and, and in this case, it was sort of a popular, a popular piety of the frontier. So those are all pieces that we can explore. Yeah, and I think it's a mistake to sort of um, to to think of what's going on in in Texas as somehow totally divorced from the the way that other parts of the of the Spanish Empire are relating um, to each other. Um, the Patria Chica is very important. Um, but what it does is it creates this idea of this local identity, but then there is a tie to the broader Spanish world through the, through the king. Um, and we have to remember that in essence, uh, Texas is a creature of Spanish imperial geopolitics and, and not much else. There isn't an economic drive to settle Texas because there's no gold here, there's no silver here. Um, it's in the wrong direction from the uh, avenues of trade and, co and imperial commerce. Um, it doesn't supply um, a, a vital resource to the, to the empire. So what's it here for? And what it is here for is to protect uh, the king's dominions from foreigners, whether those foreigners are indigenous or those foreigners are European rivals and later the North American rival. Um, and so the settlers of Texas are military men. They've, they work for the king. Um, they are indigenous people who are under the care of other agents of the king, missionaries. Um, and they are uh, practicing a religion which is, and they're being told, is a universal religion. Uh, that, that Catholic brand of Christianity is the only legitimate Christian way of, of, uh, of practicing um, any kind of spirituality, if you will. So for all of these reasons, even though you've got this very intense local dimension, because it, it is, in fact, very insular, given the, the lack of, of internet access and, and, and Twitter and, and the rest of it, um, these people have a hard time communicating with the outside world, but they, do, they are linked to that rest of that Spanish world through the king. And so it, 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 it's going to take a lot to push them over the edge um, and many of them never do go over the edge. Um, independence is, and there's a, there was an article by uh, Felix, uh, Felix Almaraz um, did an essay for the Bear County Historical Society many years ago on uh, Governor Martinez, who was the last Spanish governor, and he actually transitioned into the independence period and talking ab about the acceptance of the Plan of Iguala uh, and independence in, in San Antonio, and the point there is, is uh, they were reticent to let go because they'd had two really bad experiences of what happened when you rebelled against the, uh, the crown. Um, and many of them hadn't wanted to rebel against the crown. So there were, there were consequences to not being loyal. So for uh, all uh, those reasons, it becomes co very complicated. 
I, I was always amused by uh, running into a document in the Bear Archives uh, announcing uh, a holiday or a special mass because the birth of an heir or something like that. It's like, like what? what did, <laughs> <laughs> how did the people in San Antonio, in San Antonio have, you know, feel about the the monarch, the queen having a, a child or something like that. Right, right. And it, it does it does point to this um, umbrella uh, sort of identity that that uh, this that you were referring to, uh, and, and yet you know the, this this is strained. Uh, it's obviously if you look at just the the role of Mexican history and the the difficulties of achieving independence. Uh, which was not, in which the rebels didn't actually win out. Uh, the Turbide, you know, ended up being by switching sides, you know, this kind of, this kind of thing. So you, you get into this issue of um, the, the fluidity, the, the strength of the original sense of, of, of identity. And still, I think, as, as uh, Jerry pointed out, there's this, this notion of uh, uh, the day-to-day, -day, uh, although the religion is a universal religion, uh, in fact, the ties were with San, as San Fernando. It's at San Fernando that the marriages are, uh, are uh, you know, celebrated, that funerals are held, baptisms are held. So it's it's local at the same time that it's that it's universal, and and it, there's this tension there that that makes this whole issue uh, interesting uh, and ambivalent. Well, in uh, in looking at the, what you just said, Dr. Nahosa, about the looking at the documents that talk about festivals happening for the birth of someone that's overseas that they'll never see, and may really not influence them. Um, here at the Alamo, we tend to keep when we study the history of the Alamo. The year 1803 pops up, right. you know, when the uh, Segunda Compañía Volante San Carlos de Alamo de Parras appears, and uh, in San Antonio. And the thing is that most people don't tend to make the connection between why 1803 is the year they come. The Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase. You know, protecting the Spanish crown. You know, it's that whole idea that you all have mentioned before that we're trying. They're trying to keep the crown possessions intact. So um, with that, we're going to we're gonna we're gonna jump into the actual development of the identity of the Tejano people, and I and I I will toss this out to you, Dr. Inahosa, to get us started. How does that identity truly start? Well, I think you asked the, the wrong person because I, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that it's based on economics, you know, <laughs> and so on. It's, it's, does does life become better, uh, and does life become better and different uh, when uh, when economics change? Uh, does is life in Bejar better with the arrival of the American settlers and the American economy? Uh, to what extent does life improve? To what extent is there you know uh, a sense of of uh, some progress, a sense of hope, the sense that tomorrow is going to be different, uh, and you will see. Uh, 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 we have this. Uh, Andres Tijerina talked about the the activities in the uh, in Saltillo, I think, or Monclova, uh, the uh, of uh, of Bejarenos in Monclova again, showing some sense of wider identity uh, than the Patria Chica, but obviously they were looking out for their own interests. So uh, the question is, where, what, are the, what are those interests and when do those interests change? I think it's a, yeah, I, I, of course it's, it's all a process. I mean, if you, um, if you look at the sort of the political tensions that I spoke about a little earlier, and, and then you combine that with economic interest, um, those two things begin to form a particular local perspective, which obviously affects identity. Um, but also, as uh, Ernesto uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this, the caste system uh, is, is also a factor. You know, what is it? 
the caste system of New Spain, of course, um, operated in different ways in different places. Each, each community across New Spain um, uh, used different terms, uh, except had more or less tolerance about race mixing. Uh, in San Antonio, you know, uh, Amen. this was, this was a, a fairly mixed and fluid society. Uh, on the one hand, quite democratic in terms of, of, of fluidity, but not at all democratic in terms of uh, hierarchy, uh, which was required in, in, in that system. And that's, that in itself is a very complex uh, identity uh, marker as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the other piece uh, that I like to think about is religion. Um, in Raul Coronado, in a book called A World Not to Come, uh, raise an interesting uh, idea that has not really been really much dealt with uh, in, 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 in the different biographies uh, of Texas and maybe of the Tejanos, and maybe that's because it's, it's not documented very well. Um, but this idea of, of Catholic thought, uh, scholastic thought, uh, and then its, its transformation into a more liberal version uh, which is in um, um, which which Coronado sort of points out in his his really fine book, and to what extent is that expressed by Tejanos, and what role does that play? Um, it seems to me that um, it's really interesting that sometimes somehow the economic interest uh, seems to have trumped. Excuse, I shouldn't be using that word anymore. Um, uh, uh, religious, uh, r religious tradition and religious um, uh, um, loyalty, if you will, uh, as Tejanos sided with Anglo's. To what extent were they thinking about religion and what effect all these Anglo's coming in Texas were going to have on their religious, on this religion of that of, of, of their community? Uh, and so that's something that maybe other Mexicans didn't face as quickly. Uh, and may have also contributed to this 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 Tejano identity uh, yeah. in some ways. It might also help explain why some joined um, uh, the revolution with the Anglos and some didn't. Um, maybe religion was stronger for some than for others. So anyway, that's another piece of the puzzle, I think. So, sorry for blacking out there for a moment, but I was rummaging looking for um, the defending Mexican valor in uh, Texas. Uh, which was a compilation of the writings of Navarro, because I think there's something that goes to the point here, uh, what both Gilberto and Jerry were trying to say. And at one point, um, so he's, so Navarro's writing in the 1850s, and he's writing for the benefit of an American audience that doesn't understand the history of early Texas and what Tejanos have come through to get to the point where they are, where they want access to the things Gilberto is talking about, economic opportunity and, and so forth. And they want to do it in the context of being Tejanos, as Jerry is pointing out, and religion is still very important to, as Navarro says at another place. Uh, when he, um, but he says here, the noble citizens of Bejar sacrificed their lives and property, performing heroic deeds of valor in the year 1813. Yet they left to their descendants no other inheritance than the indifference and ingratitude of the Mexican Republic. They never received any compensation or indemnity, not even the due respect and gratitude from their fellow citizens of Mexico. So Navarro, um, and, and again, he is, he is trying to court the sympathies of an American audience that is in fact, at that point, uh, the Know Nothing Party is in ascendance in the area, and he's trying to challenge them to talk about the, the legitimacy of the rights um, of the Tejano population. And that legitimacy is couched in terms of, we too fought against tyranny. We too fought against monarchy. We too fought for our independence at an earlier time, and we suffered for it, and we have continued to suffer for it. So, uh, and, and all we want is our fair share, if you will. So um, by the 1850s, uh, you're seeing a, at least a part of the uh, Tejano population 
uh, trying to uh, form an identity that is not couched in 1836, but couched in an earlier revolution in which they had the leading role, which was the 18, 1810 Mexican Revolution. Um, Interestingly, of independence. Interestingly, though, the, 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 that I, the passage, which you know, I think I have read it before, and it sounds very familiar in, in another sense, is that people on the frontier always use that about the central government. You know, we are people on the edges. They say, we are doing all of this stuff and never have received recognition from the central government. Uh, and it's interesting that they bring it up at this point because I'm not sure they would have said that uh, uh, in, in an earlier age related to the crown. I, you say, has the crown never supported us? Has the crown, the crown ever you know, seen how we valiantly defend the crown interest against foreign interests? <clears throat> well, Gilberto, there's that, there's the, that 1787 um, memorial that uh, when the when there's the big discussion over who owns the the cattle, right. uh, who owns the livestock, and in that 187, 1870, I'm sorry, 1787 uh, memorial, you're already seeing uh, aspects of of that very argument that um, you know the, the the why should the king want to own the livestock that's loose when we're the ones who have been busting our rear ends um, to, to raise it. And it was brought here by us, by our ancestors um, and for our benefit. And they may have gotten loose, but they've gotten loose because we've been so busy fighting off the Indians. Um, so they're already making the kinds of, of arguments. They're standing up for their rights in their own way. They're not, they're you know, just because they're subjects of the crown and they're happy to be Spanish subjects and they're happy to defend the Spanish crown doesn't mean that they don't see when their rights um, and when their uh, potential are being restricted. And also, you know, I, I think you see that you, you see that consistently. Yeah, I think so. And not only that, but and sometimes it was in, uh, over very frivolous kinds of, at least, at least. Um, seemingly frivolous kinds of issues where, you know, um, the governor is, is instructing the local people to build in the, in the, 18, in the 70s and 80s, 1770, 1780s, to, to, to construct a jail. You know, you need, you need to build a jail here. The jail is falling down and then the local people say, well, that's not our job. You know, that's, that's you know, I, we, if you want a jail, then send us some money and we'll build a jail. Um, and uh, and so they were very, very protective of, of that local prerogative that, uh, uh, and I think that shows all the way through. And that's why earlier I was referring to this sort of political, this political provincialism, uh, the, uh, localism is very important in protecting their rights because although they are part of the, the empire and they, for the most part, are not, not, it's not a problem for them to be part of the empire, but they do, but they do still have to protect their local interests uh, through the cabildo, and this was, of course, characteristic of all of colonial Latin America, you know, during this time. To what extent, Frank, do they actually pay that Mesteño tax? Well, I mean, we well, obviously the problem with. Um, uh, so the problem with ball. cattle, the problem with cattle <laughs> rustling, <laughs> is that you only know about the ones who got caught. That's um, right, and quite a few do get caught. Uh, but there, we do have surviving records. They're not uh, consistent, um, uh, so you you can make qualitative statements about them, but not quantitative statements. But there, but the the number of permissions that one sees in the Bayer archives the number of permissions that are issued to go out to quote unquote hunt for, for cattle um, are, are rather consistent. And the, the Mestenia Fund uh, does uh, have a substantial amount of money in it. And cattle drives in the, in the 1770s and the 1780s um, and particularly in the eight, late 1780s when they have to pay the tax even though they're arguing against it. Um, and they, they, don't, they, they don't finally have a settlement on that case. It's, that case starts in 1777, 
and it's not settled until 1792. Um, and the decision is, and, and the Crown is very Solomonic about it. They, 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 they split the baby, right? So they, they don't, you don't have to worry about anything that happened in the past. And moving forward, those cattle that are unbranded will have to pay the tax. So they're, 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 they rather, uh, they're rather careful uh, not to overly antagonize the population. So the, the, the population knows, um, and Spanish colonials in general, uh, understand that um, they, they have certain rights as Spanish subjects. Um, they can petition the king through whatever courts are available. Um, minimal as though they are on the frontier, um, and they can try to redress what they see as uh, what we would call today in, in our modern political environment, over government overreach. Uh, so I'll give you another example. It's not a Texas example, but it's one from, from um, Co uh, Coahuila, and that is that um, there's an effort to increase the Alcabala from 4% to 6%. And all of the merchants and the Alcabala is the excise tax. Um, and, and so all of the merchants raise holy hell over the, the increase in the tax. And eventually after a couple of years and going back and forth, the, the, uh, the treasury officials finally say, yes, you're right. It's too high. It can go back to 4%. So there is, um, and, and I, I guess because of the black legend, there is a tendency in the English speaking world to think that, um, that uh, the Spanish empire is monolithic and autocratic and it's all top down and everything, whatever the crown says goes. And it's not that way, document after document, whether they are political, economic, uh, social, cultural, they, talk, they speak to a complexity, a web of relationships that, that, that often come from the ground up. Um, and that Patria Chica concept is at, at the root of it, that people have a sense of their local prerogatives and they, and they are, and they understand that they're entitled to defend those local prerogatives. At, at the same what time, things have this wider ties. Yeah. One, one of the, um, Oh, um, I think I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, uh, go ahead, let's, uh, anybody else, I, I, whatever it was I was going to say, just slipped out of my head. Of great ideas that were being discussed. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were talking about- oh, I know, I know, I'm sorry. But, what, I was gonna, what I was going to say is in some ways, uh, one way to think about it is through uh, the idea of negotiation. Uh, in other words, the, the, the local cabildo was in constant negotiation with the authorities, and um, and in a sense, they they held a lot of power uh, locally. At the same time, it wasn't really a, a democratic kind of institution. It, it represented sort of the elites, uh, because the elite one cabildo would select the next cabildo, and the next one would, and so they're all the primos, you know, and the brothers and fathers and sons are all uh, in there. But it does represent a local interest, certainly in an empire that was not designed, obviously, to be democratic. Uh, so some people say, well, it wasn't democratic. Well, it wasn't democratic because it wasn't designed to be democratic. And, uh, but nevertheless, local communities had a great voice in, in, in doing what they needed to do. So I think yeah, that's- that, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and it's, and so it becomes a kind of a um, comparison of apples and oranges um, the, the Spanish empire is built on a hierarchical model. Um, there is no sense of, um, equality. Um, there is a sense of place. Here is your place in that hierarchy, but every place in that hierarchy has not only duties and obligations and burdens, but also rights. Um, and, and privileges. Uh, and obviously the higher, are, the higher you are on that hierarchy, the more privileges and the more rights. But nevertheless, even at the very bottom, and you see that even in Texas, uh, slaves have rights. And you see, again, in the Bear Archives, in the San Antonio uh, County Collection, uh, there are a couple of 
of documents. Uh, there are wills setting slaves free. There are con contestation of um, abuse. Um, there are efforts to change owners um, because they've been abused. There are governors investigating the illegal um, enslavement of Indians. So there is a sense that even though um, uh, castas or people of mixed uh, heritage and particularly mulatos and Indians, the people on lower end of that hierarchy were subject to corporal punishment and people at the higher end of the hierarchy were only, um, uh, were only punishable by pecuniary means or imprisonment um, that um, you had a right to defend yourself. And, and that right is both personal and community. Great. The question originally was the uh, participation in Mexican independence. So the, uh, not to <laughs> take over. Oh, you want to bring it back, huh? <laughs> well, let's, let's see where, you know, to what extent did Mexican independence uh, threaten that system? Uh, to what extent did people feel like they could go through the independence movement and basically the system would persist, which in okay. fact, the three guarantees, yeah, the three sort of said, okay, we're gonna be independent, but nothing's gonna change, you know, except, you know, we don't have the classifications anymore. Uh, but, you know, for, uh, beyond that, uh, was Dr. Hinojosa. Was there Inojosa. a real overthrow of the system, in other words? Dr. Hinojosa, I, I think that the overthrow of the caste system, I mean, you know, it, it's like with the three guarantees of Iguala, you've got the insurgents, a faction of them making common cause with a faction of the royalists, but at least that central demand of, of Jose Morelos is included, that there, there will be an erasure of, of caste distinctions. Um, you know, that's the you know, dare I say it, that's kind of the radicalism of the Mexican process of, of independence. Right, but and, it, and it did mean, and it did mean something. Let me, let me just say. The let South me, really didn't expect things to change. The Civil War is over, but nothing's really going to change. Well, I except see. that there's, a, there's, there's, the, there's the possibility and, the, and there's the hope. And so let me, let me say that uh, Refugio de la Garza, who was a native of San Antonio and the parish priest, um, and, be, and therefore one of the most educated men in town. So that when they scratch their heads about who do we send to Mexico City to represent Texas in this constituent Congress that's supposed to create this constitution for this new Mexican empire. Well, let's send him. He, he's at least been out of here and he's gotten an education. So Refugio de la Garza goes to Mexico City and one of the things he writes back as they're drafting the const uh, as, they're, as they're writing legislation um, it is that now we are all equal and the divisions have been ended. Um, and so, and, and at another point he writes, uh, the servile language has been abolished. And so there is that hope at the very beginning that things will change, that uh, equality will happen that the that the that the technical uh, or the paper abolition of the caste system will lead to a real um, movement uh, toward equality. Um, but it's also and, it, go ahead. I was going to say it's also the case, Frank, that um, I think that the caste system, at least in Behar, as I mentioned earlier, the the, the caste system oper had operated in different ways in different places throughout throughout Latin America and Mexico. Uh, but the caste system uh, is uh, is already, um, in some ways, uh, under assault even before independence, as um, as you get this sort of fluidity. Uh, and, and the further away you are from Mexico City, the more fluid your caste system can be. And we already and there's already cases in, in during the Spanish period, which you you've also written about, uh, Frank, about people who could climb through the caste system um, based on get, you know good marriages or, uh, or accumulation of wealth or whatever. So that, so that whole notion of the caste system, particularly in a place like San Antonio, everybody understood it is, is somewhat, some, somewhat slippery, right? 
so they would have support, obviously, I think Behad would have supported this whole notion of, of, of eliminating the differences yep. in the caste system, but that wouldn't have been necessarily true in central Mexico, where the, the, where the elites were much more um, dependent on it for, 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 for their own protections. So I think that, I think that the, there is this more, um, this more democratic feeling in, the, in, the, in areas like, like San Antonio uh, about social, social hierarchies. They don't obviously disappear. Uh, and it would be interesting to understand how much they were affected, that is, Bejareños uh, or Tejanos might have been affected by sort of that ideology coming across with Anglos. Uh, about how white people are all are, are all free, but obviously they they still wanted to still wanted to reinstate slavery. So th these are there, there's this question though that if you if, in, and there's this attempt to compare one frontier with another, and if you look at Yucatan, well the caste system doesn't disappear at all, and so it once again. You know, I hate to bring up the economic determinism, but what you have in Yucatan is you have a, a an economy that is rest that rests on that caste system, and basically a slavery system. Uh, and in Texas, the the ranching industry does not lend itself to the same kind of caste system. Is that connected? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I um, I think that. Uh, it's like, you know, I mean, if you look at, at Cuba um, at the end, during the Latin American independence period, it doesn't w want to be independent because they've got this slave system and they're making lots of money and they're producing lots of sugar. And so, the, you know, that's why, it's, that's why there's no real rising in, in Cuba until much later. Um, but I think that, that those things all, I think, are relevant to thinking about the Tejanos and, and their attitude about, about um, about the Anglos from economic from an economic point of view. So I'm gonna uh, we have we're running short on time, and I want to hit the last question, which is, um, what important role did the Tejano community have in the Texas Revolution? And I'm tossing this one out to Dr. De La Teja to start. Um, we we were running till 11, but I was just told that we can stay a little longer. That's not a problem. But um, I want you all to be able to discuss this topic as well as y'all have been discussing the others. So. I'll let you take that one, Dr. De La Teja. Well, the, um, obviously, um, many of the leading um, Tejanos, particularly in, in Bejar, um, cast their lot with um, the changes being brought about by, the, uh, by Stephen F., people like Stephen F. Austin and other American businessmen. So um, there is, there has always been um, the impression that um, Tejanos might have been, uh, to to uh, paraphrase uh, John Quincy Adams, that the uh, Tejanos might have been the um, the dinghy following the man of war of the Anglo Americans, uh, but in fact. Um, they had their own particular reasons for, and as I mentioned, as I read earlier from Navarro, uh, I don't think Navarro is looking back from the 1850s to the 1813s and skipping over 1836. I think he's using 1836 as, as a stepping stone. Um, and he's saying, um, we've got, we fought for freedom. We started fighting for freedom from Spain. Um, Mexico didn't do right by us. So we just continued our struggle for independence based on the fact that, that we did not get a fair shake from Mexico. So we didn't do this fighting in support of Anglo-Americans. We did this in partnership with Anglo-Americans because we all had a same, the same kind of sense of where Texas needed to be and, and to go. Um, so in that sense, and I, don't, I won't monopolize the conversation, Every, obviously there's gonna be differences of opinion, but my, my, from my point of view, uh, the federalism of that leading Tejanos exhibit based on local prerogatives, based on local control, based on the lack of uh, what they perceive as the lack of support 
from Mexico City for their interests uh, makes uh, rebellion, participation in the rebellion um, on, on their own terms, um, a, um, a necessity, really. Uh, they don't see a future um, in Mexico, uh, within Mexico, apart from um, their partnership with Anglo-Americans. So it's, it's very much a sense of not following, but um, participating with. I, I think that's, I think that, that's certainly true. Um, but, but as, um, as Alberto has suggested, I think the economic piece is also uh, really important here um, because those, those who um, join the rebellion are, are people who see their economic future uh, with the Anglo-American community. Um, and I think their goal was to have an independent Texas state a province under Mexico. Uh, but when when push came to shove and they had to choose one or the other, I think the, both of those things came into play. There's sort of this federalist idea, but also, you know, where are we going to be better off economically uh, in the end uh, is what they were thinking, I think. The other, uh, but again, uh, it, it, it'd, be, it'd be good to know, uh, I, I, good to see a study on, on the people who didn't join, who didn't join the revolution and you know, who, who, who were they and what was their what was their reason for not joining it? I mean, I, we always talk about the Alamo, but the question is, why were there only eight in the Alamo or nine or whatever it was? Uh, and, Good. And, and so I think that's that's, that's eight that we know about. <laughs> yes, that's right. Circumstances. Uh, well, so, no, the, so the question becomes, you know, most most Tejanos were laying low and heading out to their ranches. Um, and so that says something as well. And then you have people like Carlos de la Garza who joined Santana. And so that says something, but we don't really know exactly what all those things say. Um, the, the issue would be, the question also I think would, would be interesting is whether or not they envisioned uh, in a, a Texas seceding from Mexico, you could look at it as a secession. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I'm not sure that they foresaw that that the wider scheme of things that Texas would request admission into the union, and uh, which of course they did immediately, uh, and and which was refused for bigger political reasons, you know, in the American issue over slavery. Uh, did did these Tejanos envision themselves? Uh, moving all the way, I mean, they, they saw their interests linked to the Anglo settlers, but that they see their interests linked to the greater American system. Well, right? you know, that's a very interesting question, Gilberto. And I think that, um, well, David McDonald uh, in his book on Navarro mm -hmm. uh, tends to uh, make or makes the argument that Navarro did in fact um, favor uh, the American Union, that he looked up to the United States and that he saw it as a positive. Um, and, and, I'm and I'm leaning toward when I revisit Juan um, in, in talking about uh, Seguin as someone who did not see the United States as the ultimate goal, who saw the Patria Chica, who saw Texas as the ultimate goal, which is why his experience is different from Navarro's, why he winds up in Mexico for an extended exile and then ultimately winds up leaving the last 20 years of his life um, in, in Nuevo Laredo. Um, and so uh, Jerry's right, we do need to see if we can discover the documentation that will let us dive deeper into the people that didn't choose the um, the revolt, uh, the revolution, uh, the people who chose to remain loyal to Mexico. Uh, but one, one big question we're gonna have to answer is what did Mexico mean to them? 
And that I think is in, is in flux. And it's something that I'm struggling with as I look at both Erasmo and Juan Seguin, because I have two generations of, of political uh, leadership in San Antonio um, who have to navigate multiple changes in sovereignty. And the, uh, in the case of, of Juan, what does he do during the American Civil War even? Um, and so um, the, we have not heard the last word on the formation of this Tejano um, identity. And we have not heard the last word on, on how Tejanos uh, expressed their loyalties during the, the Texas Revolution, uh, much less the Mexican War of Independence and later on the, um, the American Civil War. These are all, these are all linked. Uh, we One. cannot compartmentalize them. We have to right. study, we have to try to arrive at an understanding of, of uh, it, it's kind of like understanding how, uh, why, um, why Lee, uh, who is a general in the United States Army and a West Point graduate, mm -hmm. when his state secedes from the Union mm -hmm. and is offered command of United States forces, says, no, my first, um, my, my first loyalty is to Virginia. Well, I am a Virginian a, first. Another, another, uh, another way also to think about it um, is contextualizing this whole story, the Tejano story, in a broader 19th century with uh, with Latin America, because um, the, 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 in in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, Dominican Republic, and other places. You had figures who faced the exact same things as a century as a century wore on. Uh, you have a big annexationist movement, mm -hmm. uh, and that is people wanted to annex their countries into the United States in mm -hmm. in, in the Dominican Republic, in Cuba, and even in Puerto Rico. In fact, Puerto Rico, we're still dealing with that issue. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right, and, and, right. So, and so, what is it? So, so I think we can learn something by understanding mm -hmm. how Latin Americans uh, of those of, the, of those generations actually saw the United States. Some of them, you know, uh, Jose Martí, for example, was a guy who was great. Thought the United States was a great model uh, for Cuba until he came to live in the United States, mm -hmm. and then decided, well, maybe this is not going to work for us, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so these are so contextualizing the Tejano story uh, outside of the locale, the, the, lo the local might be useful also as we as we move forward. The one of the things that I found about the Alamo story and the Tejano community is there's a point where Travis is upset because he says, you know, why are the Tejanos leaving town? <laughs> right. And it's sort of <laughs> they like, know how well, this ends. <laughs> well, you're like, OK, well, the, a lot of them were alive in 1813. They knew right. what happened. Right. You know, they, you're not going to stay where an army comes and and and, and, and the, the the 1813 issue is is important because they they may well have seen it as an outside. I mean, this guy, you know, uh, Gutierrez Celada is not, you know, mm -hmm. it's not from the Texas region, right? Uh, and so, but the fact that Gutierrez Celada saw the bigger picture of getting supplies and volunteers from the United States. Uh, if, if someone from, where was he? Was he from Camargo, I think? Was he? Uh, would you um, have he was from uh, Mier. From Mier. I, I thought it was Mier or Camargo. But in case, it, it really, it's, it's one of those uh, Rivereño towns. The fact that they had links to the United States, you know, it's, it's really, you know, mind boggling. Uh, right. Let alone, you know, the Jareños having links to the United States. Yeah. Gutierrez, Gutierrez de Lara, at least, is uh, is from Tamaulipas. Right. And then when he gets when he gets removed from command, they bring in Alvarez de Toledo, who's born in Cuba. And then you get this rift with Menchaca, who is the head of the local pro Republican Army of the North militia, who doesn't trust this guy because he's not a local, right? He's not even from Tamaulipas, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing about uh, these, these fractures uh, because of the, the, you know, what you've been describing about the Patria Chica and the local interest in the wider scheme of things. Uh, the, the wider links is really surprising. Uh, 
and it to me it seems like the the little patria chicas mm -hmm. uh I, I don't want to contradict my good friend Jerry because I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> the Patria Chica can be exaggerated because of oh. uh, these, these sure. wider links. I mean, what, what is Gutierrez Zelada doing in New Orleans? I mean, obviously, right. it's not the first time he heard about New Orleans. It's obviously through merchants, I presume merchants in Matamoros, that he has these links to uh, mm -hmm. Louisiana and, and the United States. But it's... it's, it's yeah, well... Uh, we, we, we drifted away from 1835, 1836. But, but back to 1813 just, again. Yeah, back to 1813. <laughs> uh, well, I find that a lot more interesting, actually. There's, there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of things going on back then. But, but in, the, in the period between 1805 and 1812, repeatedly, um, uh, both Cordero, uh, Governor Cordero, and then Governor Salcedo are shot down in terms of getting the equipment, the provisions, what the, what they need to mount a proper defense of Texas, they keep being shot down by the Comandante General and the Viceroy. And so what do they do? They turn to the United States. They send agents to the United States to look um, for, for those supplies. So we, the, the ties to the United States are there. A lot of them were illegal. They were smuggling. Sure. They were contraband. Uh, they mm. were outside the bounds of. And so those those relationships are being formed. And those are the relationships that that emerge in the 1820s. That uh, Juan Martin Beramendi is able to uh, marry off Ursula Beramendi to uh, Bowie in part because he knows that there are uh, commercial opportunities to be had by linking up with Anglo-Americans. He's Absolutely. been to the United States on trade sure, sure. missions uh, throughout that period. He's, if he's made money, he's made it by bringing <laughs> goods from the United States into Texas. Um, and so what's headed the other way? And my guess is it's silver uh, and that there's a, there's a great silver smuggling network that not only goes up through Santa Fe and then uh, across the, 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 um, the Santa Fe Trail, but that there is in fact uh, one going on through Texas. Silver, horses, mules, there's, there's a lot yet to be studied about uh, the, the economics and, and the, the social forces at work linking uh, Spanish and then Mexican Texas to the, um, to the United States that has, that has yet to be explored. Well, even the early independence movement under Hidalgo, if you think about it, when he captured, he's, where was he going? You yeah, know, he's yeah, going he, but um, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna, I hate to, I hate to do this, but um, because this has been great, but we're going to open up the, uh, the chat to questions. If we don't have any, I'm gonna ask for each of you to do a closing statement if we don't have any questions. So I am opening the chat to questions now. Anyone have a question, please post it in chat. But um, that's the thing that this, this is such a complex issue with the whole, the, the identity, because you can put this issue and you can move it to any part of Latin America and it's a community, you know, what are they doing? Um, I, have a, I have a question for Frank. Uh, in, in, given your 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 statement of how they see the frontier, the the Spanish, you know, Cordero and others see the frontier in in danger, There's, you know, uh, and so on. Why did they send Salcedo, uh, who is has very little frontier experience, is young, inexperienced? Uh, to San Antonio, other than the, the whole issue of being nepotism. Well, I, I, you know, I really think Salcedo's gotten a bad rap. Um, he had a he had a pretty um, he had a pretty obtuse, I guess, is the word I'd like to use, um, uncle in Nemesio, who was the commandant general. Right. Um, and uh, Salcedo, uh, one Salcedo had worked under his father in Louisiana, um, and so he he did 
have some knowledge of how the ooh, Mark Hamill's raising his hand, so I'll shut up. By, but I'll say that I think Salcedo was a lot better prepared uh, for the opportunity that Texas offered if, in fact, he had been if he'd had a superior who was sympathetic to what he was trying to do. OK, good. Thank you. Yes, Mark Hamill. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. What I know this is a hypothetical and they're hard to answer, but let's say the Texans had lost. Do you have any sort of a, a feel for what the region would look like now? Let's say it had never transitioned to the Republic of Texas and then later to become a state in the union. What what would we be looking at now? What type of a region or a country or I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Wow. Uh, probably something more along the lines of California. Um, since the United States would have probably taken the territory anyway. Um, the, it, things were rolling in that direction with or without Texas. And so um, the uh, California... Um, and, I'm, and what I mean by California is uh, California is a state carved out of the uh, Mexican session. Mexican session yeah. And so Texas would have been a state carved out of. So geographically speaking, it would probably be a lot smaller uh, mm -hmm. than it is today. But um, in terms of what it looked like uh, demographically as a place where you have a large Mexican population in the southern portions and, and a large Anglo populations in the northern portion and it's like it would and and the political uh, system um, it would probably look although it would have been a slave state because it would have been below the the uh, Mason Dixon line um, the Missouri Compromise line and so it would have been it would have still been a, uh, entered the Union as as slave unless it unless the whole uh, unless the whole process of bringing uh, states into the Union as slave states in the region would have precipitated the Civil War uh, 10 years earlier than, mm. than happened. Mm. But anyway, that's, that's high speculation, right? Sure. Yeah. There, there is a question as well about Carlos de la Garza, uh, okay. a scout for General Urrea. Uh, in Refugio, I'm aware most people pronounce it Refugio, <laughs> but Refugio, uh, and that uh, he, of course, later became mayor of Refugio and uh, or San Patricio. And then the question is, how many other Tejanos stayed and became leaders? So one one thinks about Jose Antonio Navarro, the late Francisco Ruiz, who dies in 1840. Uh, one thinks about uh, Juan Nepomuceno Seguin. Um, not many in the Lone Star Republic of Texas. Um, so that's the question. Yeah. Um, well, Miguel Arciniega sure. for a while is, is important. Um, uh, Jose Antonio Menchaca, or Antonio Menchaca as he's popularly known. Um, is actually one who uh, benefits greatly from ha uh, having chosen the, the winning side. Um, he is not, as people have previously thought, um, related to the um, powerful Menchaca family of San Antonio that was uh, headed by Luis, who had been the Presidio commander in the 1760s. Uh, he was from... Um, he was un, he was an unrelated Menchaca, uh, but in the um, in choosing um, to remain loyal to Texas um, when other Tejanos bailed, mm -hmm. um, he um, he was mayor pro tem of San Antonio a couple of times. Uh, later on, he gets a couple of uh, state. He's um, he's a captain in uh, ranging force. Um, he and he marries daughters off to a, to a German and a Frenchman um, in San Antonio. So he's a good example of somebody who actually benefited uh, from um, the change in, in the system. 
So there, there are a few need, more need to be studied. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, in terms of religion, going back to a point that Jerry made early on, um, uh, Tejanos are, are essentially locked out. Uh, when Refugio de la Garza leaves um, with, uh, with Adrian Wall in 1842, um, the, the whole, the, what little there is, of the whole Catholic um, uh, institutional church in Texas uh, goes into the hands of uh, Americans and then uh, Frenchmen, right, Vincentians. Right. So the, the loss is not just the loss in the political leadership. Um, it eventually becomes losses in economic and, and social leadership. And the only way that some of the families like the Turri Castillo family and whatnot um, mm -hmm. remain influential is they marry their daughters off to, uh, to Anglo-Americans and they, they form these bonds. That also happens, by the way, down in, in South Texas. It's a sure. very important, and, 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 right. and it happens in California. It's very sure. interesting. Um, uh, Anglo -Amer young Anglo-American entrepreneurs up and coming, they know to marry the, into the influential <laughs> right. local Hispanic families. Right. There, there was a brief follow-up from the questioner. Um, Rock, let me just say one, one point about this. It's how quickly the American economy moves into the area. Sure. For example, what happens in, in Laredo, the American economy moves into Laredo very slowly. Uh, and consequently, the, uh, the local people remain in power for a longer time mm -hmm. than in San Antonio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, there was a follow up, which is just to note that uh, General Urea uh, was a centralist general um, operating against the Texas Revolution, although he was also a closet federalist and was originally from what's now Tucson, Arizona. Um, and so what struck the questioner was that somebody had been active effectively uh, with militia that favored the centralists, but then managed to parlay their post Texas Revolution political career into a political career instead of just, you know, that's it. Um, so that was one follow up. Uh, there's another questioner looking for more information about the most local of the Alamo defenders, uh, namely Jose Toribio Lozoya. Um, I think we're all where he grew up in the old Franciscan mission, uh, San Antonio de Valero, the Alamo. And of course he died there uh, with the other defenders. Um, and there is that statue that was a 1980s gift from Adolf Coors uh, to San Antonio and specifically to the local um, Latino Hispanic Tejano community after the rancor of the boycott of Coors beer uh, by Lulac and by um, the AFL-CIO. So there is that statue uh, to Jose Toribio Lozoya, not far uh, from where he lived and grew up. Um, but are there any other um, ideas about where to find information about people like that? These figures that we've talked about, we need to research this more, you know? So, um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to step in. Um, sure. And uh, we're going to we're going to, we're running out of time. I know some of some of our presenters have other have to go to other appointments, but um, for that for that um, if if um, Cayetano Lozoya will email us here at the Alamo, I will get you the information that uh, where we can find more more um, history on Lozoya. Unfortunately, a lot of this is difficult to find because uh, a lot of stuff hasn't been translated, unfortunately, and. Uh, and that's a big language is a barrier. And so that's one of the unfortunate things. But um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panel for, for allowing us to bring you into the digital realm to help provide a, an educational uh, experience for our visitors. And, um, and I hope that we are able to one, one day do this event again maybe focus more on one small subject if you are willing to help us out that, that way. And um, on behalf of myself and the people here at the Alamo, 
I'd like to personally thank you all for your expertise in this matter and um, wish you all a wonderful Saturday. And once again, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us and we hope to do it again. Glad to be here. We'll see you all on, we'll see you soon. Hopefully next time we'll be in person. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.